Well, welcome to um, this short, what will be a short lecture, just kind of wrapping up some of the things that we talked about with respect to evolution and specifically natural selection. The next lecture in this series deals with um, sexual selection. So just to, oops, my, uh, I disappeared. Um, okay, there we go. So just to recap, right, we talked about these cabinets of curiosities. These are, these are uh, colonizers from the global north going to the global south and other countries and quote-unquote discovering things that they had never seen before um, and bringing them back to Europe and putting them in these cabinets of curiosities, which would later become natural history museums um, full of skeletons and carcasses and, uh, and, and rocks and, and feathers and, and anything that, that these sort of colonizers, what we would call explorers, would find could find that um, they had never seen before in Europe, and they brought them back, and they were cabinets of curiosities, and these things actually led um, these colonizers and the global north of Europe and other scientists in Europe to to start thinking about um, extinction and the the possibility that that life wasn't set. Uh, by our creator, right? That the great chain of being isn't real, that God is not at the top, followed by angels, demons, man, animals, plants, minerals, etc. That actually evolution um, and the processes of natural and sexual selection actually have are what have created the diversity of life on earth um, and not this great chain of being, not this God created everything 5,000 years ago and um, that's just the way it is. Instead, species come and go, um, they evolve, they go extinct, etc. All of these things happen because of the environment in which we live. So our exploration of this biology, as I mentioned in class, begins with Car uh, Carolus Linnaeus, um, who named all of these species of animals and plants still arguing that we should pursue the great chain of nature, <clears throat> but also the first to point out that plants and their sexual reproductive organs look very similar to animals. And so he compared the various parts of plants to animal um, uh, sexual re reproductive organs, like um, the vagina and the vulva and the sperm and the testes and the penis, etc. And here's a, <laughs> a diagram uh, showing that connection. And he, put, uh, he created this classification system, which we actually still use today, although we've changed it dramatically. It no longer um, operates in the way that Linnaeus had it operating, where he was grouping things by how they looked to his eye. So for example, plants with big dicks and plants with big vaginas, plants with big vulvas, etc. were all grouped um, together. And so while the Linnaean system was hierarchical and nested, okay, it didn't explain everything as I'll get to in a moment, but the way that he grouped things, again, was by how he saw them, right? So for example, um, humans and mice both have a gland, therefore they're mammals. Um, and, and birds and humans and mice have a, a digited limb, so they're tetrapods, etc., etc., etc. But again, emphasizing that Linnaeus still argued that we should pursue the great chain of nature. So he wasn't a firm believer in evolution, but taking his hierarchical and nested system of classification and making it into a perfect great chain is hard, if not impossible. So it is because of this that we must reconsider, we at the time needed to reconsider the order. And along comes Cuvier who says, instead of looking at what these things look like on the outside, we should look at what they look like on the inside. So instead of classifying all animals that have the same type of ear, we should actually look to see what's inside beyond what the human eye can see just by looking at something. So instead of how Linnaeus grouped plants by, for example, if they had big penises, if they had big vaginas in the same group, uh, Cuvier is saying, let's look at the internal anatomy, and he's dividing things into four embranchments, 
vertebrata, mollusca, articulata, and radiata. Okay, which you can see here. And he also is arguing that the great chain is not viable. So while Cuvier takes it a step further than Linnaeus, he doesn't take it the extra step to say that organisms can evolve. And the reason he says this is because they have the perfect correlation of parts and are put together like well put together machines. So while this helps improve the classification, and also Cuvier was really instrumental in um, progressing the idea of extinction, he did not believe in evolution. He did not ascribe to the tenets of evolution. But he did talk about catastrophes, which ultimately led us to understand extinction, and specifically mass extinctions, when lots of animals and plants and organisms die at the same time. We've had five mass extinctions on the planet, and we're probably in the midst of our sixth. Cuvier called these catastrophes, um, and you can read some of his, some of his writing here. He, he learned of, of these catastrophes. He, he arrived at these conclusions because of skeletons that were found on, uh, by colonizers in, in North America um, that, that um, looked like an elephant, a North American elephant, for example, but ended up being actually the American mastodon or the woolly mammoth, right? And so Cuvier figured out that this, this woolly mammoth, this American mastodon, was no longer alive. There were no elephants actually living in North America. Therefore, it must have gone extinct in a catastrophe. So Cuvier was really instrumental in saying that creatures do go extinct, but that they don't evolve. And the reason was because of this correlation of parts. But... Obviously, this is a problem, because if creation was perfect, if things didn't evolve, then how do you explain fossils? How do you explain all of these things? Cuvier couldn't explain them in the way that Darwin could. So you've watched the video about Darwin, you learned how he arrived at his conclusions um, through studying different species on different islands of the Galapagos, for example. Um, his voyage on the, on the HMS Beagle was between 1831 and 1836. He went around the globe, but the epicenter of, of really um, the work that he did on evolution was in the Galapagos Islands. And what did Darwin read during this long trip? Well, he read Lyell's new book on the uniformitarianism view of geology. So Lyell is saying geology, uniformitarianism, right? Rocks accumulate slowly. This is a universal process. Darwin said, what if that also applies to living things? And it turns out he was right. Um, <clears throat> so you've watched this video. Um, so some of the, the observations that Darwin made are fossil marine forms found at the top of mountains, uh, fossils which resemble, resemble organisms that are, um, oh my gosh, what's happening? <laughs> um, which resemble organisms now present now present locally, not to other fossil forms in different different lands, right? For example, um, these uh, ancient looking capybara, um, and in the Galapagos, which was the epicenter of his work, he found the existence of only a few animals on recently formed volcanic islands, each very different on different islands, but derived from the same species on the South American mainland, namely the finch, right? So there are four different types of finches that Darwin observed on four different Galapagos islands, all derived from a similar species on the South American mainland, but adapted to their natural environment. Some had long beaks for for pecking out seeds, some had large beaks for crushing um, nuts, etc. Right, and so it is this finding that led Darwin to conclude that these must have all evolved from the same species. So Darwin asked if the Earth is really old and changing slowly, with his insights from uniformitarianism geology. Uniformitarian geology. What about the creatures that live in it? There are patterns across biodiversity, both geographic and anatomical, which indicate that evolution is real, and this ordering is wrong. 
So naturalists try to arrange the species, genera, and families in each class on what is called the natural system. This is what Darwin writes in The Origin of Species. So what does he mean by this natural system, which is basically throwing out this ordering in lieu of Darwin's evolution ordering. So Darwin made two really important points. Okay, He argued that the old ordering was based on analogous traits. Meaning, all of these species have wings. So Linnaeus, and even Cuvier perhaps, may have grouped these species in the same uh, family, right? But actually, they are in no way related to each other. Uh, well, I mean, they are related to each other far back, but they're not immediately related to each other just because they have wings. Their wings are analogous traits. They're similar forms which are adapted to similar environments, meaning flying, but they're independent of the origins of the structures. Okay, and I'll leave this up here for you to pause and read. So instead of this grouping, Darwin said, actually, it's more like a tree, that there is, an, there is a species that is an ancestor that breaks into two new species, that breaks and continues breaking. Analogous traits have nothing to do with this. What Darwin was really looking at were, oh my gosh, homologous traits. <laughs> homologous traits show us where the species came from, what the ancestors of the species actually is. So for example, humans, cats, whales, and bats all have hand-like structures, but bats have wings, whales have fins, humans have hands, and cats have paws. Okay, so these are different forms adapted to different environments, but they have the same origin, the origin of species, right? So Darwin said, instead of these groups, it's actually a tree, and at each branch, evolution divides the species, divides the families. So this is some of um, Darwin's drawings, evolution in Darwin's world means common descent. This is a very important distinction. Okay, so instead of it being this hierarchical ordering system of Linnaeus, Darwin said actually it's more like an evolutionary tree, or he coined the term phylogeny or phylogeny. Some more, some more writings where Darwin is, is sort of postulating and thinking out loud, why should similar bones have been created in the formation of the wing and the leg of a bat uses the art for such totally different purposes? This is the homologous traits, right? For example, um, sharks, ichthyosaurs, and porpoises, porpoises all have tail fins, but sharks evolved from fish Ichthyosaurs evolved from land reptiles, dinosaurs, and porpoises evolved from land mammals. So these are all analogous traits with different origins, okay? Independent origins of the structures. So the distinction between analogous traits and homologous traits, super, 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 super important. Analogous traits occur and they come about through what's known as convergent evolution, which means that they divided a long time ago, right, in the phylogeny, but they've come back together to form a similar uh, structure, a wing, for example, because they all live in the air and they need to fly. And this is convergent evolution. It's different than the origin of the species evolution from an evolutionary tree that Darwin was describing. More analogous traits are eyeballs. Our eyeballs are very different than octopus eyeballs, which are very different than the eyeballs on flats. They're flies. They're similar structures, but different origins. But Homologous traits are all of the eyebrow, eyeballs between these species, which we might call mammals, right? Or vertebrates, really. So among all vertebrates, eyes are homologous, okay? They all came from a common ancestor which had an eye from which all of these eyes evolved. So these eyes are different than these eyes, which are analogous traits. So to sum this all up, organisms share homologous traits due to common descent, and they share analogous traits due to adaptation to similar environmental contexts. Some of these homologous traits are rudimentary or vestigial, which means they have no functional use anymore. For example, whales have hip bones because they evolved from land mammals, right? So 
Fish came on land, evolved into mammals. Mammals went back in the ocean and evolved into whales and dolphins. These are vestigial traits. They're homologous traits that have no functional use anymore. So if we go back all the way to the beginning, we can argue that the ultimate homologous trait is our DNA. Our DNA is all essentially the same, right? We share, in fact, so genes, right, which are DNA sequences from a protein, um, the genome or the gene or the DNA could be considered the ultimate homologous trait. Okay? And so Darwin broke this long-held view of the essential differences between the species because we all have DNA, right? We all share this homologous trait of DNA. And there is actually a remarkable amount of DNA shared between, for example, mouse and man and all organisms. For example, another random human has 99.9% .9 of the same DNA as you, but a banana has 50% of the same DNA, identical DNA as you. Okay, and bananas are very different than humans. So you can see that, that DNA is a common trait among all living things that we all share. It's like the ultimate homologous trait. I'm going to skip over this. And I'm going to talk briefly about the process um, of evolution. So these, for example, are, are all members of the same species. These all members of the same species. Dog breeds, all members of the same species. We forced this evolution on dogs by selecting the type of look or the type of performance per dog that we wanted, right? So dachshunds are different than retrievers because humans bred them to be different. This process of breeding, much like humans bred all of these brachia to be, to be different, broccoli versus cabbage versus kohlrabi, right? We did this to dogs. What we're essentially doing here is we're forcing natural selection onto a process. But in the, in the world, corn is also something that humans have bred to be the way that it is. Pigeons, same thing. So how does this all happen? Humans are selecting for traits and characteristics, right? So humans, in this case, are selecting for example, when we're looking at, at, these, at these brassica plants, kohlrabi has been selected for its stem, kale has been selected for its leaves, broccoli for its flower buds, Brussels spots for its lateral leaf buds, cabbage for its terminal leaf bud, and cauliflower for its flower buds, right? So we're selecting these different um, types of Brassica oleracea to give us what we want. So we are performing natural selection artificially. And this is known as domestication, artificially selecting organisms, breeding them based on particular traits and exaggerating them, designing them to suit human needs. But in the real world, this happens, and it's called natural selection. And new species can emerge through adaptation to local conditions. So let's say that we've got um, species B and species, uh, population B and population C of zebra, right? The dominant trait here are stripes because the zebra live in an area where the stripes help them, help protect them from predators. The recessive trait in this particular example are white zebras. So after many generations, okay, oops, as these two species potentially sort of uh, mix around with each other, you're going to end up with most zebra being striped because striped zebra survive better in this environment. Okay, that doesn't mean all zebra are striped because there can still be recessive traits, but most zebra will be striped. And we're going to watch this video in class. We're going to watch a couple videos in class uh, when, we, when we meet again. Um, and so I want to leave it on this slide because I want to have this discussion in class. So some observations <clears throat> about 
natural selection. Individuals vary and variations are, are heritable. You can inherit them. But all organisms struggle for existence. Okay? They struggle in their environments. Certain trait variations give individuals an advantage in surviving and reproducing. And those individuals with variations that confer an advantage will live longer and have more offspring. Those variants will become more and more common in the environment. This is the principle of natural selection. Okay, and with that, I'm going to end this, and we will cover all of this, all of your questions.